the rally is now beginning. So can make their way over here out to, and then we can begin the speeches. Ask them to grab some signs, K-10. What's that? Ask them to grab some signs. Yeah. The road grab, is now starting. Grab some signs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't normally talk during these videos, but why not? Please grab a ticket uh, on the way out. Perfect. Yes, that's why the police are here to block to make sure traffic is blocked. That's why I like this. All right, well that's good. Yeah. Speakers over there in front of me. But I don't need to be in front of there in order for you to hear it. I don't know if that's okay, folks, we want people to come out here. We don't, nothing's going to be happening here. Everyone out on the streets for us, we have to clean up and get rid of everything here, anyways. So please, please move them out to, uh, out to the streets. And maybe we can get a chair. Bob, can you get a chair for Lynn? Lynn. That's it. Okay. Okay, folks, again, we're asking for everybody. Now it loads onto the street. 2.30 Sherburn Fight Back campaign. Really appreciate seeing everyone here. My name is Cheryl. I'm a longtime community worker around the neighborhood. And um, I'm going to, before we start with our uh, speakers, I'm going to ask uh, Lorraine Lamb to come up and do our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Lorraine. My name is Lorraine and I am an immigrant displaced from my own homelands, but I do have the privilege of being here today. As an immigrant on this traditional land of the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, and Mississauga peoples, I recognize that my livelihood on this land was made possible because of the people who came before me, and in particular because of the stewardship and the care of this land by the many First Nations people who called Turtle Island home before contact. And in the country that we know as Canada today, we talk a lot about truth and reconciliation, but we cannot have reconciliation until we actually acknowledge truth. And the truth is that the way we talk about land as a commodity is rooted in colonialism. The truth is that people who lived on these lands before colonization were living in good relationship with land. The truth is that the education that I received in the Canadian school system did not teach me a full or accurate reality of history. And the truth is that the system today continues to misinform and miseducate. The truth is that the legacy of colonialism has continued through generations to this day. And the truth is that land acknowledgements are futile until there are actionable steps and commitments towards reparation and reconciliation. An example of such futile efforts is the number of city meetings that I've sat at, which begin with land acknowledgements and then proceed to make policies and actions that continue to displace and criminalize an overwhelming amount of indigenous people. And so for myself, I commit to learning and listening from teachers in the community, including grassroots organizations like Toronto Indigenous Harm Reduction, and also from individuals like my friend McLeod. I commit to be willing to sit with hard truths, especially when I find myself feeling defensive. I commit to laboring and to doing the work required to work towards reconciliation. And this leads me to today. The piece of land that we're here to fight for, 230 Sherburn, this piece of land is being commodified, profited off of, while indigenous people are overrepresented in the number of people who are unhoused, criminalized, and displaced. This piece of land that we're fighting for is going to be developed into for-profit luxury housing, while just down the street from us, indigenous people here are living in Allen Gardens, criminalized, while a local councillor is racist towards their sacred fire. I 
commit to joining the work to fight against corporate greed around this land and to have it be for the larger social good and for the people. And I hope that this is an invitation for you to join me as well. In my own language, doze. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to make a couple of just quick announcements just to lay out what's going to happen here. We're going to have uh, about five or six speeches here today, and then there's going to be a march from here down to the Royal York, which is one of the uh, properties owned by Kingset Capital, and there'll be a couple of speeches down there. There is going to be an accessibility van for anyone who needs help to get there, and so the march and the uh, speeches down there will be about be about another 45 minutes to an hour after we're done here just so you know okay so um, once again thank you so much for being here I just want to say that many of us uh, recognize many familiar faces many of us has been here on this corner in front of the property at City Hall at Metro Hall um, doing huge amount of advocacy work for over a decade to demand the expropriation of those that property across the street for social housing and in the midst of what is now a complete and outer utter housing crisis and disaster um, we see that even city council finally had to declare a state of emergency on homelessness expropriating this property would have been a huge and significant step in showing the commitment to building social housing, especially in this community where there is such deep need for supportive and ongoing social housing. But instead, the city only put forward an 11th hour bid to purchase, and we all know that the outcome of that has been that this has fallen into the hands of Kingset Capital, a billionaire real estate cor corporation that if you look on their website they talk about how they're so proud that they work with so many high net worth clients um, so we know that if they continue to go forward and get their hands on this and we can't get this expropriated this will lead to greater gentrification displacement and many more deaths in our community so we know that we have to continue this fight and so I want to bring up our first speakers, uh, Annie and Shelley from the Friends of Chinatown Toronto. Oh, here they are. <laughs> our Friends of Chinatown, also known as SPOCT for short, we are a grassroots group fighting for community-controlled affordable housing and economic and racial justice in Toronto's downtown Chinatown. Our advocacy centers the needs and voices of the working class, seniors and immigrant communities who rely on Chinatown for cultural and economic resources. For those who are unfamiliar with the neighborhood, let me give you a quick overview. Chinatown was born in response to legislative racism against the Chinese. The neighborhood is over a hundred years old. Despite being called an ethnic ghetto, it was a refuge for Chinese and racialized low-income families and workers who could not find a home or seek a living elsewhere. Despite changes over the years, the neighborhood was built on the backs of the working poor. Today, it remains a place where seniors, the undocumented, and refugees do not only live, but build community. In the last, few, in the last decade, we have seen the neighborhood change. There is a widening income and demographic gap between the racialized workers, seniors, and the tenants of rooming houses, and the rich, wealthy, and white residents buying up condos and properties in Chinatown. Affordable grocery stores and eateries are slowly disappearing, and food banks are becoming crowded. Opportunities for affordable housing are being swallowed up by for-profit developers. These losses will continue if we do not fight together against corporate interests. So in 2019, FOC formed out of the urgent need to bring our community together and to fight against a planned development that has already stripped a heart, uh, a stripped a heart in the, stripped a block in the heart of our neighborhood. This proposed development at 315 Spadina, despite the housing crisis in Toronto, no affordable units were considered for this building. Similar to what's happening at 230 Sherborne, the city and developers willfully ignored that this development was taking place in a racialized, low-income neighborhood in desperate need of affordable housing. 
We demanded that this building commit to 100% affordable housing. The response from the developers, Reichman International and Podium Developments was, we can't afford to make these units affordable. The Reichman family is worth $2.33 billion. Apparently, they can't make the building affordable because they're more interested in profiting in for-profit housing. With the support and rally of the neighborhood, we were able to fight for a measly 10% affordable units. That's only 19 out of 216 units proposed. The city wanted to call this a victory, but we know that this is not enough. 10% is nothing to celebrate, and we know that our, their limited imagination will not define the scope of our dream for our neighborhood. Like 230 Sherborne, our neighborhood is being targeted by Kingset Capital. About a year ago, we spoke to a small business owner who was kicked out of their unit due to rent eviction and rent increase shortly after Kingset purchased the building. The building currently sits empty, and based on our independent research, we have, we have reason to believe that Kingset is looking to create more land assemblies, purchasing blocks of adjacent units to create larger property sites. There is a looming fear in our neighborhood that developers will continue to demolish, develop, and displace residents in our neighborhood. Today we stand together with 230 Fight Back and the community members of Dundas and Sherborne in resisting for-profit luxury development. Shame on the city for their apathy and inaction in this housing crisis. Nothing for us, without us. Expropriate housing or expropriate land for social housing now. Thank you, Annie and Shelley. Thank you for that reminder that this is happening all over the city. This is a citywide, this is a nationwide uh, thing that's happening in terms of the continued monetization of properties and land. Um, our next speaker is uh, Wally Kogali Ali, who's an organizer here in Regent Park. What do we want? Housing! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Housing! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Housing! When do we want it? Now! Thank you, my friends. Thank you, comrades. My name is Walid Kogali Ali, and I'm with the Regent Park Neighborhood Association, and I'm here to share some very important information. We're living in an era of greed. Greed, corporate greed, but greed that is meant to displace many racialized and indigenous of our neighbors, many neighbors. And I just want to start off by talking about affordable housing and what affordable housing means to all of us. Because the greedy developers and policymakers that are basically making it almost impossible for good people, hardworking people who are people who are in need of mental health support, people who are, are impacted by poverty, they're making it almost impossible for them to live with dignity. We all believe housing is a basic human right. We all believe that. They don't. They don't believe that. And I'll tell you why. The definition of affordable housing that the city of Toronto passed because so many of you worked so hard to make this possible was to define affordable housing no more than 30% of household income. That was called OPA 558. That was the bylaw that was passed. A couple of greedy developers last year in November went to the Ontario Land Tribunal to challenge the definition of affordable housing. And they wanted to challenge it from an income-based model to a market-based definition. So think about this. A one bedroom is going for $3,000 to rent. To rent. It's $3,000. Imagine if developers had their way and for affordable housing to be now defined as 80% of $3,000. Who? Who can afford 80% of $3,000 in the city? For one bedroom? Nobody. This is intentional. This is meant to gentrify. This is meant to displace black. 
indigenous people from the downtown core. So, what do we do as a community? We fight back, that's for sure. We push back against that definition of affordable housing by coming together and participating in the Ontario Land Tribunal. By, by showcasing the greed, by calling out this irresponsible developers that just want to make money. Now here's some research. What is the definition of affordable housing based on income was being debated at Ontario Land Tribunal? A bunch of greedy developers put some applications in. So let me give you some stats. So, 180 days prior to the appeal, 89 properties and 20 active development projects put in application. 16 out of the 20 applications were either an open a rezoning application, leaving 4 out of 20 as site plan approvals. BJL Properties Incorporated came up three times as the developer and landowner. The real estate brokerage with the development arm. 12 out of the 20 applications can be considered large scale developments. So we're talking over 100 units with various heights from 10, 20, 28, 29, 31, 44, 49, 54, 57 floors and 60 stories. Guess this. Just, just take this in. Only one out of the 20 active development projects mentions affordable housing units. So this is all available on the city's AIC website. So in total, with the 20 developments, 180 days before that appeal, there were 4,316 total units, with 32 being outlined as affordable housing units. 32 units out of 4,000 316 units. That is greed. That is absolute greed. And what we did is we made it clear to the public that this is unacceptable in the city during a housing crisis. And guess what happened? They withdrew their appeal. They withdrew their appeal in February of this year. All those greedy Developers said, you know what, we cannot take this public embarrassment anymore, but we're going to withdraw it. And now OPA 558 is in full force and effect in the city of Toronto. Okay? So that's the good news. But this is not the end of the news, my friends. Region Park right now, my neighborhood, my community is going through a rezoning application. And I'm not sure if you know what a rezoning application does, but it allows the developer partner to build more density. So at the community consultation session, I'm with the Regional Park Neighborhood Association, we posed a simple question, a very simple question. What will be the definition of affordable housing that you're going to use in phases four and five? What is the definition? Guess what the response was? Well, we don't know if it's going to be based on income. We don't know if it's going to be OPA 55A. But you know what? We're thinking it might be 80%. 80% of market. Which region park resident is going to call that affordable housing? This is what they want to build. This is what they want to pass at city council. And this is coming up on June 22nd at the East and York Region Community Council meeting. We need to stand in solidarity with each other. We can't allow, we can't allow for greedy developers to get their way at City Hall. We cannot allow for definition, for policies to be written that gentrify, racialize indigenous communities from the downtown core. We cannot let that stand. Okay, so I need your help. I need you to remind Councilor Moyes that it's his responsibility to stand with the residents of Regent Park and residents across the city of Toronto and reject, reject that application to rezone without the proper definition of affordable housing, okay? That's just one issue. We wanted a, a central community space. You know, we're sick and tired of our youth and our seniors and many folks that need support for being told, you know what, it's five o'clock, you gotta go home. Okay? We need a central space to do the organizing and the work and the services that we need. And that's another issue at the table. 
I would love for you to talk to me after this or connect with me and I can tell you more about this. But let me tell you something. I came here intentionally because I am sick and tired of developers running the show at City Hall, making those sizable donations to all those mayoral candidates, by the way. Okay, follow the money. You'll see which developers behind which candidates. And I was actually impressed by one mayoral candidate that I'm supporting, which is Josh Matlow. And the reason why I'm supporting Josh Matlow is because he promised something that many governments have failed to do, which is build public housing through the government, introduce rent controls in the city of Toronto. We know Doug Ford took away the rent controls. Let's bring it back in the city through city-controlled properties and rentals. And let's actually address what's going on, which is community wealth disappearing from our community. Let's make sure that the wealth stays in our community, the housing is controlled by the community, so we stop this trend where now one bedroom is going for $3,000, right? We need to stop this trend. So lastly, I'm gonna say this. I, wanna ch I want you to challenge every mayoral candidate. I want you to show up at city council. I want you to show up at the community council, even if it's online, and speak up. Because if they feel that no one is watching, they're gonna push forward this agenda because they'll think there'll be no consequences. And we need to remind them that there will be consequences. And it's not just elections. It's every day until elections. We will be making noise. We cannot be pushed out of our communities. Solidarity to all of you. What do we want? Housing! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Housing! When do we want it? Now! Thank you so much, and solidarity always. Thank you, Ali. Um, I just want to make a, just a little announcement that there's lots of food back here, so if you haven't had food and you want to take some, please. Last call for food. Last call for food, even. Okay, there you go. Perfect timing. Uh, it's Bob Rose. Uh, he's a former program coordinator and senior staff at Parkdale Activity and Recreation Centre. He's now retired. He's also the co was or is the co-founder of the Toronto Drop-In Network and mental health and homelessness activist. Here he is, Bob. The night I heard that King said had got this property, I had a nightmare. And that nightmare goes back 30 years ago. When the hospitals decided to discharge all the folks in the asylums who were incarcerated in the asylums and put them into the community. And the government broke its promise to build housing, decent housing for them to live in. And that's when I met the Tunisias who owned this property and bought it for a song and sold it for $50 million. Because they were slumlord tycoons across this city. And then I had a moment in my nightmare where I saw King Set. And it was this monster. It was a monster and its message was, we're not, we don't care about you, we don't want you. We're going to make sure that you're shunned and that you're displaced from your community and other people are going to move in. Better quality people. Bullshit. This is a nightmare that has knotted into the foul ropes. I call them the foul ropes of the financialization of housing and the foul ropes of government support for those large corporations which are taking over our neighborhoods and taking people's lives from them. We can't let that happen with this problem. Now you know what? I'm so glad to see so many people here because this is the beginning of a campaign and we are going to need lots and lots and lots of people to bring our messages to government and to, to let these developers, these multinational global co corporations know that they're not going to get away with this forever. We're not going to allow them to ruin our communities and destroy people's lives. So let's get to the grid of this. It's important to recognize at the beginning that it's government policy that has catalyzed the financialization of housing. And how's it done that? Well, 
it's cut back on the welfare state. People are living in poverty on welfare and on ESP and unemployment insurance, all of the things that are needed to help people when they're in a difficult place. And it's also cut back on social housing. It stopped building those social housing in the 90s. So this is just, this just come over 90. We want to talk about the state's focus on the on the on the financial sector and housing solutions. Like we can't, we haven't been able to convince them that this is a pub, this is for the public good, and this should be for public ownership. But no, they're turning over the housing crisis to private developers, knowing that they're not going to solve it. In fact, they even boast. There's quotes. I have quotes from the CEO of Starlight saying. Financial crisis, housing crisis, is good for business. We'll make more money. Consumers may not be happy, but we will be. So we have to terminate the government support of these, I call them, housing robber barons. They are housing robber barons. And they only have one mission, and that's to grow, grow, grow and make as much money as possible to pay back to their investors. Because that's who's running these corporations. It's, our, it's investors. We're looking to make money on the backs of human beings. And that means abandoning them, or harassing them, or evicting them, and all the different strategies of these multinationals, Starlight, Achilles, Hazelwood, all the strategies that they're taking in different neighborhoods, they all come to that. We want a different quality of tenant here. One who's got more money, one that doesn't have any problems, one that will make the community more attractive to the rich and less accessible to the poor. So guess what? Here's the situation right now. You know that 6% of all housing stock in Canada is social housing. That's it. Six percent. That's how much social housing we have in this country. And also that these multinationals are really monopolies. They share, they trade names, they buy each other out. So it's hard to figure out who owns what in these hedge fund supported equity based investments that do not care about providing a home. Yeah, we need some people to carry this banner, so anyone come on up. And here's a, a little, little tidbit for you. It's not just a big city phenomenon. Guess what? Starlight has a partnership with Kingset, and they own 70, 85% of the ho rental housing in Nunavut. And in Yellowknife, 75% of their housing, rental housing, is owned by an investment corporation. So what we've got to do is we've got to take this issue as a housing right, that we have a housing, a right to housing, and take it onto the streets, pass the paperwork. This country, this province, and this city must ensure an adequate supply of social housing with social supports as necessary that is genuinely affordable for those at the lowest end of the economic spectrum, including those who are homeless and those with no income. And we have to create diversity. We've got to take it away from the public, private sector and build housing that responds to the needs of communities and give communities the power to control the development in them. There's a few recommendations I'll make at the end. These are not mine, they're, but they're out there. We need to terminate the large-scale monopoly ownership of housing. We need to expropriate housing that is owned by financial firms violating human rights. We need to prevent the, f the lending of dollars to financial landlords engaged in predatory practices. We need to stop subsidizing financial landlords with a national housing strategy. Because that's what's happening. They're, good. they're running their money on that national strategy, they're taking it, and they're running 
it through the CMHA to get good, a good deal on their dollars. That is a crime. So the last thing I want to say is just thank you all for being here. And I'm a Nova Scotian boy, so I can look around at this crowd and I can see that every one of you has salt in the blood. Because that's the terminology we would use down east. Salt in the blood, the fishermen say, you know, you got courage, you got love, you got commitment, you got endurance, you got salt in the blood. So thanks all for being here and let's walk. Thank you so much, Bob. Our next speaker is Lynn Walker. Do you want, Lynn, do you want me to bring the mic to you over there? Yeah? I'll bring it over. So Lynn is an Allen Gardens encampment resident. Here she is. Hello. Uh, my name's Lynn. Um, my name's Lynn, and I've been living in Allen Gardens. It'll be 21 months on the 15th of this month. Um, I've lived through two winters there. Uh, in the time I've been there, there's been from a few tents to one tent to we now have over 80 tents. And it's going to rise and rise and rise. And um, all the people in Ellen Gardens, they're my family and my community. And I care about everybody. The reason people are there is because of the evictions, rent evictions, uh, people saying, oh, my son's going to move in, family. Um, but it's all about raising money. It's, it's about raising the cost of living. And it's really hard on people to, to just try and survive. Like, I've, I've survived through everything. Um, um, yeah, we, we, we have to survive. Sometimes there's no food. Sometimes, sometimes there's too much food, too much stuff. And, and I find the world is a material world now. It's like just buy, 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 and, and waste. Things, yes, I, uh, the, the government does, they put us against each other. Um, well, I've been in Allen Gardens, I've seen so much waste as far as money goes. Like, they've had four security guards on me 24 hours a day with when I'm the only person in the park. Now, I don't understand why, it, that's money that can be used for housing. Now they have, again, they have four security guards there walking around doing nothing all day long or sitting in the car sleeping. That's not right. That money could be used for housing. All the, all the wasted yeah. money I see. I've seen Jarvis. Jarvis Street has been ripped up three times. I've seen that. Why not do it once and do it right the first time? Like, it doesn't make sense. Why are you wasting money when people's lives, you, you're, they're out there and people's lives, they're losing their lives because of what's going on in our city. Uh, in our country. It's not just the city, it's the country. Um, I see ambulances, fire trucks, police cars every day, sometimes for the same person. They go to the hospital, they sit there for hours. I've been at a hospital for 10 hours, 10 hours, and not one person in that hospital touched me. By the time after 10 hours, we kind of took a wheelchair and, and came back to Gar Allen Gardens because I had no shoes, and it was raining out. <laughs> it, it, it's actually been returned. <laughs> but um, um, it's, I don't understand. Like, people, people, when you get housing, your lives become better. I've seen better people, people go through drug phases, and, and I've seen them grow to be better. Like, let go of the drugs and let go, go of the alcohol. Um, 
is. Um, I can't think because I'm not an Alan Gallagher. <laughs> um, but um, we need to march and we need to stand up for each other <laughs> and and fight because all these buildings are taking away our land and our homes. And where are we going to be? Where are we supposed to go? Like the city comes every day to take tents. They say, we're only taking tents that nobody's occupied, but that person could go get a coffee and come back and their tent's gone. That's their home. That's their personal, their taxes. They get their taxes done. They get their ID done. And then they steal their homes with everything in it. It's, it's, it's very shameful. Or they'll say, we're going to store your stuff. And what you give back is two sleep eggs, and, and does anything important to you is gone. Yeah, very much shameful. It's so shameful what they're doing in our country. It's, thank you very much. And let's, let's march. Let's march. Oh, no, that was great. Thank you so much, Lynn. And thank you for reminding us just about the ongoing violent displacement of people in encampments. Uh, you know, the militarized response that we saw uh, last summer or a couple of summers ago. So I'm losing track of the time, but um, thank you. Thank you for your words, Lynn. Um, so the next speaker, I'm going to bring Lorraine Lamb back up here from the Shelter Housing and Justice Network. Lorraine. So my name is Lorraine and I'm here as an outreach worker. And honestly, my job shouldn't exist. I shouldn't need to be an outreach worker because people should have housing and people should have food. People should have access to water and bathrooms, but we don't. And I've been an outreach worker for 15 years and I remember when I first started, people were talking about 230 Sherburne and 15 years later, we're still here and it's the same fight. I'm also here as a friend who's lost so many people in the streets because of preventable things. I know someone who applied for housing in 2010 and they brought me their original housing connections response. It was like the original thing, so it's like a little crusty, it's basically fossilized. From 2010, and they hadn't heard anything and finally, Recently, I reached out and I found out that actually he got an offer in 2016, but because they couldn't locate him, they just canceled his application. And so now we're going to have to start all over again. And so someone might say, well, maybe he should have just followed up, but here's the thing. He was living pretty transiently, and how is someone supposed to just follow up every week to say they're still interested in housing? I mean, he was homeless, so obviously he was interested. I know not one, but I know two people who have cancer diagnoses who are living outside. And instead of having a roof over their head to process the tough news and to recover from chemotherapy and radiation, they live in tents. And meanwhile, this land that we're talking and we're fighting about, what is it going to be used for? I know someone who has been homeless for decades, most recently displaced from Novotel and the Strathcona when the programs closed. So he sleeps at McDonald's and stairwells and rides transit. And you know, when he had a place to sleep, he walked upright and now he's hunched back because he has nowhere to sleep. Meanwhile, the city is closing two more shelter hotels this August and hundreds more people will be displaced. And meanwhile, this land behind us What's happening with it? This week, Victoria Gibson just wrote in the Star about how the city's own data and its own counts are showing that encampments and the number of people who are homeless is going up. People have no housing that's affordable, not affordable by city definition, but actually geared to income affordable. And circumstances are bleak. And meanwhile, this land behind us, is gonna be condos? Shelters are full, the city is closing more shelter hotels, people live in ravines and in parks, they find refuge in coffee shops and transit and stairwells and libraries, but wherever they go, they're not welcomed and they're asked to move along. Meanwhile, this land behind us, what is it being used for? 
We know that this condo will displace vulnerable and poor people once again. And it will be people who are racialized, people who are poor, people who are indigenous. Ironic because the city is going to start turning on their messaging around how we celebrate indigenous lives because it's June. But meanwhile, what are they actually doing to back that up? And so where are people supposed to go? because we hear conversations around safety. But whose safety do we really refer to? Because in my opinion, it's not safe for people to have to live outside. It's not safe for people to have to pee in public because we don't even have the decency to offer public bathrooms. It's not safe for people to be violently displaced from shelter hotels that provided stability and now they have nothing. It's not safe for people to be unhoused in the face of systemic violence and structures. It's not safe for 230 Sherburne to become a luxury condo. So whose safety do we really care about here? And so what we really, really desperately need is geared to income housing. And meanwhile, this piece of land is going to be for-profit luxury condos? No. And across the city, we hear about pilot projects and, quote, revitalization plans, which we know is code for social cleansing of poor people. Because, you see, revitalizing is about restoring something to life. And the fact is, this neighborhood already had life. This neighborhood took care of each other. This neighborhood helped keep each other safe. This community worked to survive in the space and faces of oppressive institutions and systems. This community does not need revitalization. Revitalizing is about gentrification. It's about putting unaffordable condos in areas that are primarily home to racialized and poor people. For the last 10 years, I worked at Young and Bloor, and when condos went up around it, poor people were displaced and rooming houses torn down. Those residents had nowhere to go, and my friend David died on the streets. When condos went up on George Street, they said that Seton House needed to be, quote, revitalized. A lot of those residents are still displaced to nowhere land in Scarborough. When condos went up in Regent Park, those, quote, mixed income units were not affordable to Regent, How Regent Park residents. Those people are displaced. When condos go up and gentrification happens, poor and racialized people are increasingly criminalized and surveilled. They are targeted. They're not welcome in grocery stores like the Fresh Co. at Parliament and Dundas because they seem unwell. So what do we think will happen when a condo goes up here? Who's safety is the most threatened. We need geared to income housing, and we need it now. We needed it yesterday. We needed it 10 years ago and 20 years ago. We don't need more condos, and we definitely don't need that here. There's a local counselor who talks about homeless people being service resistant. And in my experience, that is absolutely the biggest lie ever, because people want services, and they reach out for supports. I met with someone today who's working a cash job every day, trying to find a place, but he can't find someone who's willing to rent to him for the amount that he's able to. And he's also a young black man, so we know that there's a lot of subconscious bias that's happening there. Each person I work with is receptive to services and supports, and everyone tells me, I just want housing. Here's the thing, there is none. And I know that King said, I know that they don't want to be targeted. Maybe they think they're just doing, quote, legal business, and that's what they're allowed to do. But here's the thing, they are complicit, and absolutely complicit in the harm and displacement and violence towards poor people and unhoused people. And if they continue with this development, they will be complicit in the deaths and displacement and this isolation that this community will continue to experience. This land could have been so much, so so much more than a luxury condo that we do not need. Let's march on. Thank you, Lorraine. Before I uh, introduce Gaetan, I just want to mention that if anyone needs the accessibility van, it's right here. If you could start to move towards it, uh, because after Gaetan speaks, we'll, we'll start marching. So here he is, Gaetan Aru. Every, I don't think you need an introduction. <laughs> okay, folks, uh, it's going to be very short. We're going to march. Thank you for sitting in, on concrete in the hot weather, listening to, to everybody. Uh, all I want to start by saying is, although this is a local fight, it has national implications. This is a fight that is going around, uh, around this housing crisis in every poor community across the country. So for us, 
You know, when Kingset paid $53 million for that property, we said, like, fuck, they're not going to be able to build anything there. We're going to stop them. This is part of that movement. We're going to mobilize in Toronto and we're going to get together and fight this. I just want to make a couple of quick uh, announcements that we are having another action. The CEO of Kingset is coming, uh, is going to be speaking on Wednesday, uh, June uh, the 14th at 100 Queen, uh, Key, Queen's Key East. We're in inviting everybody to be there at 11.30. Uh, it's a banquet, $150 a, a plate, $1,500 a, a table. So please come out on Wednesday, uh, check out our website, we have other actions. So uh, let's get ready to march. Uh, we're basically gonna march over to Rory York. Gonna make a quick stop in front of Kingston. Uh, we're gonna take about two minutes to pack up the speaker, and uh, please people get on the streets, we'll get ready to march. Thank you so much for coming, let's go.
ones who refuse to buy to sign anything. And she's the only one who refused to sign and she stayed. And she was there for a year and a half in that building. 15 floors. Massive building. 15 floors. And she spent most of COVID in that building by herself with the support of her daughter. And it sat empty all that time while she stayed there. And then in 2021, the city bought the building and she was still there. Betty Robinson, 101 years old, took a stand. She took a stand. Surely, I'm 68 years old, I'm only over a Surely we can stand a stand against King Sam. here is what's happening in Montreal too in another in an other scale maybe but that's the same specific conditions under this specific system that we're living in which is called capitalism and which you know you know what it does to people I guess and we're suffering right now in Montreal we're having like a lot of uh, a, a real crisis in housing of course which uh, it is unprecedented we've never seen that so right now, I think what's important for us to say by showing up here to be in solidarity with you guys, it's also that we want to build a national movement. We want to build something that is from Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, and everywhere in Canada so that we can fight back. I think that's very important for us right now. And we want to express our solidarity and fight back with you too. Thank you very much. Thank you. In, uh, in drawing this to a close, I would just invite people just to take a quick look at the skyline around us and behind us. Because every one of those developments, in its own way, is a monument to an agenda of greed, displacement and irrationality. Every one of those developments is thoroughly destructive to its core. And that is really what we are challenging. On the, uh, the way over here, somebody happened to ask me what the, the demonstration was about, and I told him. And he said rather pessimistically that, you know, you're not going to stop the developers, and you're not going to stop the people at City Hall, and you're not going to stop the people at Queen's Park. And I, I, I beg to differ. I beg to differ with that proposition. Um, because over the years, I've seen people in communities mobilize and make a difference. And it really does make a difference. Here, here. here is the point. look at this from the perspective, yes, 
of their apparent power and even seemingly their invincibility. Uh, the developers have enormous wealth. They have enormous influence. Uh, they bring their envelopes to Doug Ford's house and pay tribute to him. Uh, they have City Hall exactly where they want City Hall to be. Uh, even the progressive wing of the people at City Hall uh, see it as a victory if they can convince the developers to put a few extra units of not really affordable housing in the latest development they're putting up. So there is no question we are up against a very, very powerful agenda. But we need to understand something else and understand it very clearly. If we take a community like Toronto's Downtown East, which is one of many communities in this city, and across the country and even internationally on the firing line of this agenda. There is more than enough strength. There is more than enough power. And there is more than enough anger building up to stop a development like the obscene condominium at Dundas and Sherbrooke. It is possible to stop it. There is absolutely no doubt about it. But the challenge we face is a challenge of convincing people in sufficient numbers that a mobilization can work. And we can do that to an extent with the promotional material we put out. And we can do it with public meetings, and we can do it with leaflets, and we can do it with videos. But in the end, we've got to do it by way of example. We've got to demonstrate to people that it is possible to, feat, to fight against these bastards and win against them. And that's what we've got to, that's what we've got to achieve. That's really the challenge that we are facing. And we're doing it at a decisive moment, certainly in the life of the Dundas Sherbourne community. Um, Dundas and Sherbourne has been a community under attack for many, many years. But if they can put a luxury condominium right at Dundas and Sherbourne as one of a string of such developments worth billions of dollars going along the Dundas corridor, then it will be really a death blow for the community. It will mean the driving up of rents. It will mean displacement. It will mean that services are driven out of the neighbourhood. There is absolutely no doubt about that. So we've got to go after these people and we have to convince people living in states of precarious and inadequate and overpriced housing. We have to convince people who are homeless, people who are affected by this agenda, that we can make a difference. And to do that, We've got to lead by example. And really and truly, here is a golden opportunity to do so. This march was very well attended. It was an enormously important beginning in terms of the mobilization. But we need to grow well beyond the strength that we mobilize right now. And here's a wonderful opportunity to do so. A wonderful beginning. Next week, John Love, the CEO of King Set Capital, who fancies himself as a bit of a mouthpiece for compassionate capitalism. You know, if there were any Swiss Alps in Toronto, he'd be on the top of one preaching about stakeholder capitalism and inclusiveness and all that bullshit. Um, if we, if Love is going to be speaking at uh, the Border Trade AGM, it's a perfect opportunity to rain on their parade. And I understand that John Love is particularly, uh, particularly image conscious. So here's a really good opportunity to give him 15 minutes plus of infamy. And I think it's an enormously important way to begin to challenge these people. Because we won't defeat them by having meetings with uh, allegedly progressive councils. We won't defeat them by deputing at their meetings. We won't defeat them by writing an eloquent op-eds in the Toronto Star. We'll defeat them by mobilizing a community under attack to fight back. <laughs> For the people running the uh, Royal York, which King said is a majority shareholder in, this is a mild inconvenience and a slight embarrassment. But we can go well beyond that. We can build something that creates a level of disruption against these people that is powerful enough that they are going to conclude that their investment at Dundas and Sherbourne just isn't worth it. And we can go after their political enablers at Queen's Park and in City Hall in a way that creates for them a political crisis. Yes. But we won't do it just by saying powerful things. We've got to build a powerful movement. So in the months ahead, that is our challenge, to reach into the communities that we are part of and convince people they need to come on the streets, they need to fight back. 
There is a crisis of housing. There is a cost of living crisis. There is a crisis at every turn. People need to fight back. And this is a golden opportunity to set an example that people will see across this city and across this country. We are not doing this to make a point. We are doing this to stop this damn condominium and the filthy agenda.